Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, this is James Kandasamy. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you. I know I provide a lot of value through this podcast and I want you to share it with your friends, with your families and anybody else that you know that kind of benefit from listening to this kind of content. Go share it through Facebook, in through LinkedIn, through Twitter, through Instagram or any other channels that you want to share it because sharing is caring. Thank you. Let's go on with the show. Hey audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth Through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Mark Hanterman from uh, LA, uh, you know, who's, who has a, a very interesting background. Uh, and let me go through his background and uh, his target market uh, and we can go a bit more deeper into that. I just want to say hi, hi Mark. How are you? Hey James, uh, I'm great. How about yourself? Good, good. Very good, very good. So Mark owns almost... Uh, 450 units uh, and out of that 450 units 225 of it was even before syndication right so which is which is you know, we can go a bit more detail into that the interesting part about mark i mean he has a many interesting things i mean he buys in la california and and also austin right so but i think he started in la which is a market that everybody claims that you can't buy deals and, and he also syndicates in LA, which is you know, very interesting as well, because I've seen many, many my friends in LA and California say that, okay, yeah, there's nothing to buy in California as things are too expensive. So we can go a bit more deeper into that. Mark is also a writer. Uh, he's a writer for Family Guy, right? And a few other movies as well. So he's a professional writer, right? So hey, Mark, um, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Sure, sure, sure. So Mark, uh, you know, I may have like summarized to a, you know, too short of a summary about your background. Why not you give your version of your background? How did you get started? What's your, what's your original uh, or what you are doing right now? And how did you get into a uh, real estate, especially multifamily real estate? Sure. Sure. Okay. I'll make it much, much longer than uh, <laughs> <laughs> <All right, that's laughs> right. too long. I'll make it too long. I'll go the opposite yeah, direction. No worries. Go ahead. Go ahead. No worries. So, uh, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, I had never really known anybody in the uh, real estate or, or in the uh, entertainment business, but I was dumb enough to to try. And uh, so I moved out to uh, New York after college, and I got a job on this show, uh, uh, MTV show called Unplugged. If you remember it, I was an mm -hmm. intern. I got an internship there, unpaid, so uh, no money. Of course, that's MTV for you, and. Uh, <laughs> And I, uh, you know, wanted to try to break into the entertainment business uh, and, you know, not having any money and no, and not getting paid and moving to, you know, the most expensive city possibly in, uh, in the U S and one of the most expensive in the world. You know, I became that starving artist very quickly. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, and it was not, uh, that gets romanticized sometimes, but uh, there's nothing romantic about being chronically broke. And, you know, I would bolt awake in the middle of the night, panicked over like, how am I going to pay my rent next month? So, uh, you know, that went on for, for a while. Uh, and, you know, but I was, I was also trying to learn how to write. I didn't major in writing in college. Uh, I don't know what I majored in. It was something called communication, organizational communications. But so I was trying to learn how to write and, uh, you know, working 12 hours a day, trying to figure out how stories and comedy works, why it works when it works and why it doesn't when it doesn't. But I was getting very close to being, you know, completely destitute. And, uh, you know, that was that was difficult. But uh, eventually I caught a great break and I got hired to write for David Letterman in New York. And shortly after that, I moved to Los Angeles because I realized most of the business was on the West Coast. And uh, I joined a new show starting up called Family Guy. And 
those destitute days of mine were still pretty fresh. So when I had gotten my first couple script payments on Family Guy, I bought a duplex. And it wasn't like premeditated or planned. Basically, my my landlord on my one bedroom apartment in LA raised the rents maybe 150 bucks. And I was like, screw this guy. I'm I'm moving out. And uh went to an open house at an apartment, walked out of that on a Sunday morning, and across the street there was a, a house, open house, and my fiance was with me and we wandered in just to check it out. And started talking to the broker and the broker was like, you, so you have what, like $45,000 saved up. Why? What, what, you, what year is that? Just to make sure we put that. This would be 1999. Okay. And uh, yeah. And she said, you know, why aren't you putting your money towards a down payment on a house instead of throwing it away on rent? And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm in the entertainment business. I could be out of work next week and then be unemployed for the next year and a half. Like, I do not want that kind of financial responsibility of, of a mortgage. And, you know, ironically, uh, that I, I thought I would never sleep at night with a, with a mortgage payment in a house that I owned. But, you know, it's ironic because a couple of years later, that was the thing that was letting me sleep at night was, was owning real estate. But she, uh, she kind of, you know, uh, touted the virtues of, of investing in a, in a house. And I said, all right, you know, I would consider this, but you got to find me the best investment I've ever made. Something that'll give me a financial cushion in this volatile business that I'm in. Don't show me anything, anything cute. And uh, we parted ways and I figured I'd never hear from her again, but she called a couple of weeks later and she said, I found the property that you need to buy, but there's a catch. You need to become a landlord. I was like, a landlord, that doesn't sound fun at all. And, uh, but I met her at the property and it was definitely not a cute house. You know, I had gotten the, uh, the turd that I had asked for that I could turn into a diamond. Um, it was rough around the edges, peeling paint, overgrowth, but it was in a great location. And I knew that the location was on the rise. And I could also see the potential in this property. It was a 1923, uh, uh, that had that great architecture that you see in some 1920s buildings, but it was just lost under peeling paint and, and other things. And you know, the owners were raising goats and chickens in the backyard in the middle of Los Angeles. And they were planning to move to Kansas to live off the grid and uh, you know, in an underground house. And so they, you know, it was, it was completely neglected and, so I said, uh, what do you think? I said, I didn't know anything about real estate, but I said, uh, you know, what do you think? And the broker, uh, June, her name was June. She said, I think this is a good deal. I think it's undervalued. And, you know, if you're willing to do the work, you can increase the value a lot. So that was my introduction to value add. And so I said, all right, let's try it. I'll, I'll trust you and let's try it. And I put in an offer. And of course it was LA. So there were 15 other buyers in the picture that I was not aware of. And it became a bidding war. And it was a bit terrifying because every day the price was going up $15,000. And I had no idea really how to value this property. And so once again, I couldn't sleep at night. I was on this roller coaster ride. I didn't know when to get off. So I didn't. Uh, after two weeks, I had originally offered $350,000 on this property. I think it was listed at $379,000. And after that two weeks, I had won the bidding war by paying $435,000. And I thought immediately that I had just made the biggest mistake of my life. Yeah, you won the war, but uh, you probably the, the highest paying guy there. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't, like, did I I didn't know that that was did I do yeah, the right I was, thing. <laughs> I was convinced I was going to be bankrupt. This was mm -hmm. going to ruin me. Hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe even go to jail somehow <laughs> for this blunder that I had made. But I tried to embrace it and moved in. And uh, my first tenant on the other side was a guy I work with and a friend of mine named Mike Henry. He, he does voices on Family Guy for anyone that may watch the show. Uh, he does Herbert, Consuela, and Cleveland. And he was a good tenant to learn from because he was a bit of a slob. And he made fun of me for uh, being a landlord every week. And I threatened to evict him uh, 
just as often. Uh, but uh, I try to embrace it also and, and try to learn everything I could about real estate. I was a little bit, I did it in the wrong order. You should yeah, because you bought it. You bought it first, then only <laughs> right. right. I made the mistake first, and then mm -hmm. and then tried to learn. But uh, I was reading every book I could, hoping that I'd find some kind of strategies to salvage this situation. But I did catch the market at a good time. I you know I closed in early two thousand, and I thought the market was very heated, and and we were due for a correction, but. Uh, it turns out the market still had a long way to go. Uh, and I try, you know, I embraced it. I fixed up the property. And in year one, I thought I had made the biggest mistake of my life. In year two, I refinanced, got out of PMI, and also reduced my rate. Back then, I think my initial rate on this property was about a 7.5% interest rate because that's where rates were back then. Mm -hmm but I was able to lower it probably about a point and a half on a couple of occasions while refinancing. And so year two, I was like, uh, you know, maybe this isn't so bad. I, 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 it was making sense financially. I was getting income. And then in year three, Mike uh, moved out next door and I raised the rent, I think about $450 because this, this neighborhood was really taking off and I had completely turned this property in terms of the value add. And I thought, this is the greatest thing in the world. And eventually I sold a couple of years later. I sold in 2005, five years after buying it. And I, so what, I had, what I had originally offered at $350,000 and bought for $435,000, I sold for $1.27 million. And, uh, you know, and I also had been reading about taxation and... So I was able to, and I asked my CPA, I said, can I take the primary resident owner exclusion of uh, $500,000 tax-free? And can I also 1031 exchange the other side of the duplex? And to my surprise, the CPA says, yes, you can do that. And so, you know, I, I took out $500,000 tax-free and then the remaining, uh, the remaining $350,000 was uh, 1031 exchanged into a 14 unit building in Hollywood. Okay. And yeah, I thought this was I, the greatest thing in the world. I know it looks, yeah, it seems to be like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> but, so let me, let me go back a few steps back, right? Because I'm sure a lot of audience is like, wait, wait, I'm, I'm in California and I didn't find that deal kind of thing, right? So <laughs> right. are you still buying, are you still buying in, uh, in that area right now? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. I live okay. in that area, by the oh, way. Okay. I mean, I moved twice since then, but I'm still in, it's called Larchmont Village. Okay. And I, uh, yeah, I recently bought a 22 unit building and a seven unit building and I'm in escrow on a 16 unit building, all awesome. kind of that Hollywood area. So are you trying to time the market in California? Because I know the prices goes up and goes down. It's a big, large swing according to different market cycles. Am I, am I, am I correct? I would have, first of all, I think you're, yeah, I think, yeah, on the coastal markets, when it's hot, I think the reason that it swings, it, it has bigger fluctuations than other locations is because when it gets hot, it attracts not just locals to that, that market as investors. I think it gets, attracts big institutional money. It, it attracts people from around the country and internationally. I think, uh, you know, we have a, a huge, uh, there's a lot of Asian investors, uh, you know, from around the globe. It's one of the, the, you know, the United States is a destination for foreign money to, to find safe haven because we have a stable, you know, supposedly we have a, a stable political system and a stable currency, and that's rare. So a lot of international money seeks to park itself in the United States. And there's three cities in the United States that get about 90% of that investment. And that's Los Angeles, Miami, Florida, and New York City. Got it, very interesting. But somebody is losing money, right? When there's a swing, right? When there's a swing price up and down. I mean, I know the swing might be like going on a, on a, on, on the bottom of the next bottom is actually higher than the previous bottom. So 
but somebody is losing money, right? Because you know you, they they didn't time the market correctly. Is that is that yes. a correct statement? I think so. I mean, I there the conventional wisdom is never try to time the market, but I can't mm-hmm. help myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's trying to time it, and I think you can. I mean, I got in in retrospect. I got in 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 the year two thousand, and looking back. Getting into real estate investing when the wind was at your back economically and we were in an expanding phase of the cycle, that made a huge difference. That that is is largely you know, a large contributor to why that first deal was so good for me and got me hooked. Um, but I was I was always watching the economy. I understood that real estate is cyclical, and I also understood that real estate real estate can't shift as immediately based on fear and greed as the stock market can can in the stock market when you invest you could buy or sell with the click of a button but in real estate investing it moves at a glacial pace it takes you you know 70 days to close on a property and so you can't really react and and it's so difficult to transact in real estate that you know a lot of people don't make knee jerk decisions when the economy kind of shifts so i feel like you can get ahead of it i you know in 2006 you know an example of this is we were you know, i had bought i had bought in 2000 the dot com crash happened immediately and it kind of came and went pretty quickly. It didn't have a huge impact, at least where I was investing. And then it charged upwards, you know, values for the next five or six years. And by 2006, I was getting jittery on how much values had grown. So I was, I was waiting for a turn and I wanted to kind of get out prior to that. And I sold a couple buildings and traded and then, uh, I waited for the 2007 and in 2007, the market started to slide. And in 2008, I, it had slid by about 15%. And I thought that was our good opportunity and also concurrently at the same time. So I'm going to work every day. I'm I'm a writer. Uh, I'm going into writer's rooms. I didn't know any, by the way, I didn't know any other investors during that time. I was like alone. You know, we didn't have the social media uh, presence of real estate at that time. But uh, I was telling all of my colleagues and friends like that are in the writing business, I was like, do yourself a favor, buy some real estate because you know, who knows when we're going to get spit out of this business. It's volatile. You need to build a financial cushion and get away from the money managers that are taking advantage of you right now. Uh, And, and a lot of them were like, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. But nobody would do it. Ironically, like they, they were all talk and maybe it's intimidating, but eventually, you know, because I was evangelizing about real estate, eventually they were saying like, well, you won't stop talking about this. Like, why don't you find something that we could all invest in and, uh, you know, we'll give you some money. So I waited, I, I was watching the economy and in 2007, the market slides. I'm like, I'm going to wait this out and I'm going to buy at the bottom. However, I named, I thought once we had, declined in values by about 15%, maybe 20%. I bought a distressed property in October of 2008. And uh, it was a 16 units building. The The sellers were uh, were suing each other. And I picked it up at, a, at a, a, a good price. However, I think two weeks after I removed contingencies on that, Lehman Brothers crashed, followed by Bear Stearns in the entire world economy just plunged into the Great Recession. And I had five of my coworkers uh, invested with me. I had convinced them to go in on this. And I was like, oh, crap, I'm never going to hear the end of this. You know, these are, my, I, these are my friends. I see them every day. If I lose their money, you know, like, why now? Why was this the deal that I, I brought everyone in on? Um, but you know we the 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 surprise uh result of it was you know we made it through i bought at a discount i it was distressed i added value and 
and rode it out. I, we rode through, you know, 2010, 11, 12, and uh, refinanced and sold it in 2016. You know, we were, we were probably down in values, but we were getting a lot of pressure because people were losing, you know, people were getting foreclosed on. So there was homeowners that were becoming renters. And also at the same time, this was a, like a B minus C plus property. And there was also a lot of renters moving down from the A class strata of the, the rental market down to B and C. So we stayed full and our rents were actually inching upwards during the great recession. <clears throat> and we were able to ride it out. And I think we, everybody tripled their money. We had to wait a little bit. I mean, I think I sold in 2015, but, uh, you know, it was just a big sigh of relief. Now you must be really famous among your friend, right? Because you tripled their money, right? So I tripled their money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was, that was where I kind of, uh, you know, before going into that, that uh, recession and coming out of that, I thought I am always going to try to time the market. And I know people say you can't do that. I timed it on my, on the coming out of the recession. What the mistake I made was I bought too early in 2008. I thought the recession was kind of at its end in October of 2008. And, you know, it had been a year and a half old, but we clearly had a, like another two years to well, go. I think, yeah. I think that was the start, right? October, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. That was the start of, I think the all Lemon the foreclosures Brothers. had start. We had the mortgage crisis. Got it. Yeah. Got the it. mortgage crisis started in 2007 and in Florida, there was around the country, values were sliding in real estate. And then it was, it was October of 2008 when Lehman Brothers, when the huge institutional Wall Street firms started collapsing. And that okay. just sort of triggered a global, global recession. Got but yeah, it. I, I bought too early, but I also watched the market after I, I did that. I watched the market and in 2000, I was waiting for two consecutive quarters of GDP growth. That's what I was was going to be the indicator to me that we were coming out of this recession. And I found that happening in the first quarter of uh, 2012. And I bought like four properties uh, at that point. Got it. And those all timed pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good way of looking at it, right? When you see two quarters of GDP growth, because that's the, that's the, that's a recovery cycle, right? That's what you're looking exactly. at. Exactly. Right? That's what economists say. You know, I didn't invent that. That economists yeah. say that that's the sign. That's the first indicator that you're out of a yeah, recession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. So did you buy these deals looking at cash flow or were you just trying to say, hey, you know, it's going to appreciate. So were, you, were, you, were you an appreciation guy? Because I don't know that anyone was looking at cash flow at all. Yes. And I think you mentioned before that... Uh, Hardly anybody invests in LA and, and you can't, often the conventional wisdom is that you can't invest in LA. I just didn't know any better. This is where I lived. And, you know, I got to know some, some of the brokers around here. I got to know some, a couple investors. And so that's the pool that I learned to swim in. And I think probably because I, partially because I had a job working uh, as a writer, I was always looking at like, where is there a property where I can buy it under, you know, well below the cost per square foot of the average? And can I fix it up to get it to the average? Does, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I was so. like, I, and so it's kind of always, my head was always not thinking as two separate things, like there's cash flow and there's appreciation. I just wanted maximum gain. I, I want, when I sold this, you know, what can I do to, uh, to get the maximum gain on this property? And I wasn't really too concerned about, uh, you know, monthly cash flow. Got so it, I, got it. So you were looking at value add in terms of appreciation, right? Because the value has dropped per square footage. 
and I'm sure you did a comp surrounding it and you see the value is lower than everyone else. And that's exactly. the value, add. that's the value add. But you are looking at, when you look at cost per square footage, I think you're, you're basically looking at an appreciation play there, right? So, right. Definitely. But I, I invented, I think you were saying that you invented your own metric. Yeah, yeah. I, like I invented with, rent per square feet because I love that. Square feet. I love that. <laughs> I love that because you're the first person I've ever met that has invented their own uh, metrics. Metric. And yeah. I had mine. Yeah. It was like, I wanted... Mm-hmm. I, mine was a leveraged cost per square foot because got it, got I it. did cost per square foot is a pure appreciation play, but I also wanted to fact it, factor in leverage because when I, I, I noticed that when I had good leverage, when I could get 75% leverage, mm-hmm. my returns were fantastic. That was the yeah. optimal. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want to buy a uh, low cost per square foot that had you know, rock bottom rents yeah. that, uh, that you had to put down 50%. So that was my yeah. metric. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, levered, levered, I mean, what you're talking about levered and unlevered is usually a pretty institutional uh, level uh, analytics, right? So the fact that you are talking about it, I don't think so, you're a normal writer. So <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, <laughs> you probably read from somewhere that's really advanced uh, analytics, right? Levered versus unlevered IRR and all that, right? So basically- Right, and you know what happened? The whole, the whole cause of me coming up with uh, leveraged cost per square foot is mm-hmm. I would analyze tons of deals. I would always be looking at deals mm-hmm. and I would have like five deals to compare and I would get stuck because I like, this one has a really low cost per square mm-hmm. foot, mm-hmm. but this one, uh, this other one has, uh, has a good cap rate. And mm-hmm. then this other one has a good cost per unit. Like, what should I do? And I would just get... Mm-hmm paralyzed. Like I couldn't, I needed a way to make a decision across like a couple, you know, if I had four, three or four properties that all looked good, how was I going to, how I was, was I going to determine the one that I went after? And that's how I was like, I have to combine leveraged cost. I had to add leverage into it. And because leverage, if you can get, you know, the higher leverage you can get, uh, is a reflection of cash flow, mm-hmm. so there had to be built into that uh, the leverage reflected that there was cash flow. So I was buying for cash flow to a certain extent. Yeah, but I was also yeah. buying a cheap at you know I wanted the asset price to be. Yeah, like, that's the like, indication of a value add, right? Because you, I mean, you, your leverage does is is the big play in real estate, right? Because not every deal you're going to get the same leverage, right? At the same time, you combine that with the price. Now you get, you know, a, a good metrics to go across uh, units, right? Across uh, different deals. Yeah. Right? So, and it, it made a big difference. Yeah. Like starting to use that le- uh, yeah. metric. I like to use a uh, price per door divided by square footage, right? Because... Uh, Oh yeah, that's because good. because uh, yeah, people talk about forty a door, hundred a door. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so mis- misleading, right? It's I mean, totally a lot of, misleading. A lot of passive investors or even sponsors uh, doesn't even know how to right. differentiate <laughs> price per door, right? Yeah, look small, at this price per door. Yeah. but they're yeah. they're uh, they're one hundred and fifty square feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a small unit, and this is really cheap, fifty a door. Well, but the units are small, right? I mean, of course. Exactly. Yeah, I bought how a deal you- at. Yeah, I bought a deal like a thousand square feet and I bought it like 87 and that was the cheapest deal in the whole city. And nobody really see that. They said, oh, it's a normal 87 a door. Well, 87 a door, but it's a thousand square feet, okay? <laughs> yeah, what <laughs> city? Uh, it's in San Antonio. San Antonio, uh, okay. Yeah, but it's just that people don't really go into that level of details because it's very simplistic way of seeing price per door. I mean, it's good to see price per door, but you have to couple that with how big is that square footage on yeah, average. It- it gives the brokers a way to sort of wedge their way into the discussion and hey, look how yeah, look how low the cost per door is. Yeah. yeah. But I always yeah. was I had to dig past the marketing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I know. to get past I know. the marketing. I know. I was I was just talking to a broker yesterday. He said, Yeah, this deal is what um uh, 80 a door and the guy in front of this uh, property sold it at 100 a door. I said, well, but that's a thousand square feet. This is a 750 square feet, right? So <laughs> right. <laughs> you, can't, you can't pull my leg there, right? So, yeah. Because the yeah. rent is being based on square footage. I mean, there's a limit that you can't go above certain rent limit, no matter how big is your, your, your room size or your unit yeah. size. But, but thousand is pretty still within the average on the high right. side, but still average, right? So and that's weirdly, good. Weirdly, <laughs> I, I've, 
drifted in, in Los Angeles, uh-huh. the favored unit size was a one bedroom, like across okay. the country, the, across the city and, and every uh-huh. broker would say that. But, uh-huh. you know, in the last couple of years, because of, uh, you know, rents going up and affordability issues, studios have become, you know, the, the preferred unit size in an expensive city. And I had zeroed in on studios very early on because I was like, that's where you get the most rent, the that highest was, rent per yes. square foot. Yes, yes. As long as the demographic supports it, right? So I'm sure in LA, people love uh, studios and the smaller units. Yeah. Like and also another reason LA, I liked st- studios is because mm-hmm. we have rent control. And mm-hmm. so, you know, any tenant that stays in there for six or seven years, you're going to fall way behind the market in terms of where things are. So I don't, studios, a criticism of studio apartments, buildings is that turnover is higher, but in a rent controlled market, that's a virtue. Like you want the units to turn every few years oh, so you yeah, can adjust right. up to, to market. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I've I've met a lot of people who said, we can't make money in California, go to Texas, Florida, or Georgia, or whatever. I mean, that, that, I mean, the markets that I'm talking about, you know, it's, it's really in terms of, it's really good in terms of cash flow and appreciation, like Texas, Florida, Georgia kind of thing. Sure. But on the bigger city, the play is different, right? So as long as you are okay buying that kind of deal and your investors are okay, then it's yeah. okay, right? It's nothing wrong about <laughs> buying right. in this high, as long as you, and you can, you need to be a really good uh, market timer too, right? Because you don't want to buy the, I think the you high do. cycle. Exactly. You want to, you want to catch the market at, the right time. Uh, I love yeah. Texas too. I'm, I'm invested in a number of buildings in Austin uh-huh. and uh, I haven't tried anywhere else. There's other, there's other cities I want to go to, um, but haven't bought anything there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Austin is, is another crazy market. I live here and I've been trying to buy uh, in Austin with the 40 year door and it went every two years, it goes to 60 year door. I mean, Whenever they say 60 a door, I said, well, my cash flow shows is 55 a door. When I was buying, for, I was looking at 40 a door, the cash flow comes at 35 a door. And now all that buildings are like 120, 130 a door, right? I so, know. <laughs> it's I know. <laughs> so it, it's an appreciation play, right? So forget about cash flow in Austin. And, you know, as long as your investor base are okay, you know, they're being quiet when you don't give them cash flow, that, that's, that's the market uh, play. I mean, I was able to buy at least one apartment at a really good price per door. So I'm happy with that. So yeah, I, I yeah, don't you, feel left out in Austin. <laughs> right, right. That's right. I know. It's, I think everybody's there is like, did you get in early enough that, uh, yeah. you know, you can be, you're getting beat up in that market right now on pricing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, if yeah. you got in a couple of years ago, you know, you yeah. can hang your hat on that because you've made some, yeah, you've some good appreciation. Pre- appreciation play and, and, uh, yeah, it's crazy the market over here. But I mean, I think the crazy in the appreciation market, that's what it is. I mean, it's going to go crazy and you just have to, you know, uh, I don't know. We have to pray, I guess, that goes up, I guess. right? So. Yeah. And, you know, I always fall back on, uh-huh. on, on you know, the, the oldest rule of real estate is not cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. It's location, location, location. Exactly. I exactly. like strong locations, especially having gone through a couple recessions is uh-huh. you see that, you see that, uh, you know, strong locations are the first to come out of a recession. Uh-huh. Um, and they're often, you know, if you go to the core of those you know, major cities, uh, often they're, they weather recessions better. I think, uh, you know, when you chase cash flow out into tertiary markets, those seem to get hit pretty hard. Uh, when, when recessions come. Yeah. Yeah. Just because of the, the, the diversity of workforce and the strength of, uh, I mean, the, the people who are living there, right. Uh, and the growth that you see in that uh, market. So exactly. That's cool. That's cool. So, I mean, you are a writer and I know you said you read a lot of books that convince you that real estate and you start talking about real estate. Was there like one specific book, which was like the big aha moment? That thing. I, I, you know, I was already into investing, so it wasn't a, a, a book that convinced me to become a real estate investor. It was okay. because I had been thrust into real estate investing that I desperately needed to learn. Uh-huh. Uh, there was, uh, I think uh, uh, Steve Burgess has a book. Uh, it's called, I think, The Complete Guide to Impart- Apartment Investing. Oh. 
I think, you know, my experience of reading real estate books in those first, those first five years, I thought a lot of them were fluff and, uh, and didn't really, didn't really give me, you know, I was frustrated by a number of, of books, but I, I remember the Steve Burgess book being like, this is clear. This gets to the point. It's not, you know, it's not filling pages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, with like stories or something. It, it just, I wanted the nuts and bolts of real estate investing. And that one was good at providing that. Yeah. There's so many books out there, which leads to a lot of causes, right? So, you know, you want to avoid that books and go to the books that talk about the, the nuts and bolts of how to do it kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so is there any famous actor that you know uh, that, you know, are in real estate? You know, not. <laughs> or multifamily? Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, someone that I work with on Family Guy, Mila Kunis, uh, does a little bit of, you know, I think she had been doing real estate. I don't know that she's doing it uh, currently, uh, but her family did. And she and I had talked about that on a couple Good. Occasions. Uh, I don't, you know, there are a couple, maybe uh, Jeremy Renner, I heard, uh, you know, I've never met him. Uh -huh. um, but you hear about a couple, like some actors or, or, you know, celebrities that are also into house flipping. Uh -huh. And, you know, obviously, nowadays, you see a lot of celebrities that are entrepreneurial um, outside of the entertainment business. Yeah. Vanilla Ice, right? So he's in the uh, house flipping, <laughs> right? So is he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has his own show. I mean, I met him once. Uh, I think he's doing some kind of like remodeling houses and all that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's big into that. So I did not know that. I gotta yeah. give him a, <laughs> him a, an email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he has a show in HGTV, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where oh, yeah. He has a lot of remodeling and all that, but. Uh, but I also heard that I have a friend who said the biggest guy who actually wrote the syndication uh, rules for the government come from Beverly Hills and is a big syndicator. So, uh, oh, so really? I, need to, I need to trace that guy down. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. yeah. He, I mean, yeah, what I, there's, what a, I, there's a, there's a, there's a community of syndicators in LA. I know a lot yeah. of people think you can't syndicate in LA. I syndicate in LA. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think a, uh, a lot of people have asked me, you know, how, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they just blank, blankly, uh, blindly make a statement that California is not investable, right? So, I mean, it's just a different mindset, I think, right? You have to invest for the appreciation, right? And, and right. you have I to think... find that distressed deal that you found, right? So it's not yeah. any houses. Uh, just most people are not well versed with the value add, right? Everybody thinks that if I buy, invest in a real estate, I buy a house like mine. Right. Right. Whatever they're living, they want to buy another house in the same neighborhood. <laughs> right. And they yeah. say that is, that is investment, right? So. That's an investment, right. <laughs> right. And it's crazy. Right? And so. the other thing that LA that I found in my experience of going beyond LA into other markets is that huh. LA has just a ton of inventory. Huh. I think like at any given time, you know, I don't know if this is uh, that much of an exaggeration, but there are close to 100,000 properties that you could look at in the county of LA. And so there's a lot to sift through. And when you have that much inventory, there's always going to be, you know, there's going to be distressed sellers, there's going to be mom and pop owners, there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, 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 pricing that's not, uh, you know, not efficiently priced. So you're going to find dislocations in terms of pricing. And if you can spot those things, you know, any given day of the year, you could go onto LoopNet and look at all the inventory in LA County and you can find a deal. There's a deal in there if you look closely enough and know what to look for. Yeah, that's crazy, right? So, um, so what about all this rent control, uh, not being landlord friendly and all the issues that you see, you know, uh, in California? I mean, how is that impacting your business? Yeah, when when it's stable, uh, you know, rent control is it's kind of an artificial lever put on to the market, and it creates it creates uh, dislocations in the in pricing that you can take advantage of, and uh, you know, you could buy properties that you know a mom and pop owner 
owned for a long time and rents are a third of what the market rent is. And you can go in and, and, you know, you can offer tenant buyouts. I mean, that's a, that's a, the city, you know, you, they have to be involved, but, uh, but you can offer your tenants buyouts and you could calculate like how much can you afford to offer them? And you, I've done that and you could buy out tenants. And so that's a way to, to take a property and increase its value significantly. So, so I think this, in general, called cash for cash for keys, right? You pay them. Exactly. Them cash really, for okay. keys. Okay. And you know, so that, that type of rent control, I think actually creates opportunities. However, right now in, uh, you know, nearing the end of October in an election year, there's a lot of, uh, a few legislative bills floating around that are, that are a little bit threatening to real estate investors. And I'm watching those and, and I'm in a property right now that I am not going to remove contingencies on until I get the outcome of that. Because uh, if some of those get voted, voted in, it just changes the dynamic and you don't want to get caught you know, underwriting your property or your purchase at, uh, at, at a, an outdated, immediately an outdated model. <laughs> if some of this legislation passes. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it is a challenge, right? But I think you are, you're using it as an advantage, right? Uh, and, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy with all the limitation that you have on the rent control. Uh, do you see that buyers are shunning away from um, California in general because it's a rent control market or you don't see that? I mean, you see, do you see a lot of demand for your properties as well when you put on the market right now? Yes. All my properties have sold quickly and at a good price. And I think the last thing I sold was in maybe June. I think I sold uh, uh, two, uh -huh. two buildings. In the and middle yeah, of the pandemic, right? During the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but uh, I've definitely seen a slowdown in a slowdown in activity. There was a freeze, like a, a standstill in, in activity, I think in the middle of March when everything paused, because I think people were waiting to see what happened with it, interest rates. And you know, nobody knew the uncertainty caused like a big uh, stalemate. Got it. Got but it, got yeah, it. so I have seen some slowdown. And I think then once interest rates were lowered and they're very low and very attractive. You know, there was a huge rush, a huge wave of refinances, but also, you know, the activity picked up, but I think it's still below. I, I, I don't have a, a stat to give you, but I'm, I'm sure that it's slowed down. Activity has slowed down at this point. So do you do Fannie and Freddie Mac loans or do you do the conventional loans in LA? I tend I, to use- Because I don't know how they underwrite LA. Right, right. I, I, use Fannie and Freddie on my Texas deals and okay. I use conventional regional banks in LA. Why is that? Uh, I think because they're easy. They're easy to work with. It's, it's, it's a faster process. I have one bank in, uh, in the LA area that uh, I think it's outside of LA, but it's in Southern California. And I've probably... I've probably done 30 loans with them and they know me and uh, they always have good rates. I mean, my rates right now are, you know, three and a half percent or wow. below. And uh, that's where I like to be. But it's a recost loan. Is that right? Uh, no, I, I most, the vast majority of mine are non-recourse. Okay. I think maybe 80% of them, a couple of them. I think uh, I was given the choice. Do you want to do recourse? And uh, and pay a higher rate, and I think the buildings were were stable enough that I, I went with recourse. Oh, got it, got it. And what kind of leverage do you get with this kind of uh, conventional bank? I tend to try to find seventy five percent leverage. Got I don't it. think any. I've never gotten above seventy five, and I don't really want you know eighty percent or eighty five percent leverage. You know, if, if you're in the business for a long time, you start to see people <laughs> get burned who, who over leverage, but, uh, I like 75. I, I, I like to achieve 70, 75% leverage. I think, you know, in my earlier years when I would do 55% or 60%, I just saw that, you know, the end result was, uh, 
you know, the gain was not as strong. You know, you get strong, leverage gives you gain, whether it's bad or, or, or good, it's, it's how you handle leverage. Uh-huh. And if you're careful with it and you keep reserves and, you know, my policy is I go up to 75, I don't go past 75, but I try to target 75% leverage. Got it. And is it 30 year amortized or like it's 20 or 25 years amortized? Most of mine are 30, 30, 30. year amortized. Okay. 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 That's good. All right, Mark. Uh, uh, happy to have you here on the show. Uh, why not you tell our audience uh, how to get hold of you and about your company? Sure. I, uh, I started uh, Quantum Capital about five years ago. Uh, to kind of formally formalize my investment business, and I've done you know syndications since then. Uh, but uh, you could reach out to me on our website, quantumcapitalinc.com, or reach out to me directly at mark at quantum capital inc. And I also have a podcast, uh, the Wild West Real Estate Show. Yeah, Wild Wild West, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice name. So. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, I'm sure we learned a lot and uh, just opened a lot of uh, listeners' eyes about you know, how can they you know, uh, play the game of syndication and buying deals in the hot market of California, right? So even though it's, <laughs> prices are high, you know, there's, there's ways to make deals uh, work over there too. Sure, yeah. Well, thanks for having me, James. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audio book. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audio book completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.